In this video, we're going to be going over some of the basic science of climate change. We're going to be looking at what climate change is, what causes climate change, and I'm going to be presenting some of the evidence for you so that you actually understand what is happening and that it's actually real. I'm also going to have a look at some of the arguments that people make when they say that climate change is not real. And I'm going to address those and I'm going to show you their false arguments. We're then going to have a look at how climate change is going to affect the planet and those of us living on this planet. And then we're going to have a very quick look at what we can do to reduce the impact of climate change. So the question that we really need to ask ourselves is, what is this climate emergency? Is it really an emergency? Why is it so important? And in short, what we can really say about the climate emergency is that 97% of all of the world's scientists agree that human activity is what is causing global warming. Only 3% of scientists disagree. And those 3% of scientists who do disagree really can't present any evidence to back their case anyway. Now, what we also know is that if global temperatures increase by as little as 2 degrees Celsius, that is a fairly small change, then the impact on the Earth is predicted to be really quite catastrophic. A 2 degree change is going to change the Earth as we know it. Life on Earth will no longer be the same. The Earth is a planet in terms of the weather patterns, in terms of the ecology that we have now, will no longer continue. It will be a very, very different planet to the one we are used to. On the other hand, if we can restrict change in temperature to one and a half degrees Celsius, so this is only half a degree less, it's not a big difference then the impact is going to be much less. Life will more or less carry on as it is. Yes, there will still be negatives of a one and a half degree change, but it's not going to be catastrophic. It's not going to be life changing. It's not going to be planet changing. It is manageable. That all said, the time that we have left to act to keep climate change down to a one and a half degree Celsius increase is so short. We're too late already in reality. We needed to start acting properly 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We haven't? Well, let's act now. Let's not delay any further. We've wasted too much time as it is. We just need to get on with it and we need to do everything that we can to prevent this 2 degrees Celsius increase to our temperature. And if we don't take this action now, if we delay another five years, if we let people debate, if we allow politics to take place, what's really going to happen is this delay is going to cause the inevitable. It's going to make it impossible to keep temperatures down below that two degree threshold. And the impact of that, unfortunately, is devastation. Now, a lot of people are talking about the climate emergency because of people like Greta Thunberg, because of groups like Extinction Rebellion. Now, what I'm not going to do in this video is I'm not going to justify their methods for right or wrong. What I'm really interested in is the message. And that message is about climate. And that message is that we really are in trouble at the moment and we need to do something about it. I'm not going to talk about the politics of it. That is a wide ranging issue and it does need to be addressed. But I'm purely looking at the science of climate change and what we can do. So who does this climate emergency affect? Well, unfortunately, the simple answer is it affects every single person living on the planet of Earth. But it doesn't just affect every person, it affects every animal, it affects every plant, it affects every ecosystem. Now, those of us who are living closer to the tropics or closer to the polar regions are going to be affected more because climate change is going to be seen a lot more in these regions because the weather there is already slightly more extreme. Coastal regions and islands are also going to be massively affected. The vast majority of the world's population live in what we would class as coastal regions or within about 10, 20 miles of coastal regions. So this is actually most of the population that are going to be affected very, very severely by this. 
and also the poorest people on the planet are going to be affected far more than those who are richer. Of course, who's causing most of this problem? It is unfortunately the richer people. Now, I know I said I wasn't going to get into politics, but that is a fact that the richer nations cause more pollution per person than the poorer nations do. So, you will be affected by climate change. Your children will be affected by climate change. Your children's children will be affected by climate change. So I want to explain some of the key science behind climate change. And I want us to really understand how it works and how the greenhouse effect works. So very, very simply, the greenhouse effect works because energy from the sun travels to the earth and heat energy travels in the form of infrared light or infrared radiation. Now we can't see this light, but when we step out into the sun, we can feel it on our skin. We can feel it warming our skin. On a hot day, you can feel it warming things like tarmac. You can just feel the warmth being generated around you because this infrared radiation heats everything up as it strikes it. Now, a very small amount of this infrared radiation is absorbed by clouds. And that energy, some of it at least, is reflected back into space. Now, that energy that's reflected back into space does not heat the Earth up. The majority of that energy, however, will travel onwards and it will hit the Earth's surface. And as that energy hits the Earth's surface, it becomes absorbed and the Earth's surface gets warmer. Now, most of this energy is re-radiated and it escapes back into space. So although energy is being added from the sun, the energy then re-radiates back and it goes back out into space. And you have a natural balance where you don't have much heating up of the planet. You don't have much cooling down of the planet. You have an equilibrium and there is not much change. Naturally, however, and this is really, really important when I say naturally, a small percentage of this heat will be absorbed by greenhouse gases and it will be re-radiated back towards the Earth, heating up the Earth, creating a global warming effect. This natural effect is really important. Without a natural global warming effect, what we'd end up with is a planet like Mars. It would be incredibly cold there would be no life on Earth because it just wouldn't be warm enough. So the reason why we have these lovely temperate temperatures that we do, where life can thrive on Earth, where we can have liquid water on Earth, is because of a small natural greenhouse effect. So this energy will warm up the Earth. It's keeping the Earth's temperature where it needs to be. A small greenhouse effect, a natural greenhouse effect, is a good thing. However, when we increase the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and when I talk about greenhouse gases, the main two that we're talking about are carbon dioxide and methane. If we have too much of these gases in the atmosphere, we see that the energy enters the Earth just like before. Some of it's reflected off the clouds just like before. Some of it passes through to the Earth's surface just like before. But... The energy that's re-radiating back into space is going to be trapped and absorbed by these greenhouse gases. Now, because there are more of these greenhouse gases, more of this energy is trapped. And as more of this energy is trapped, more of the energy is re-radiated back to the Earth. And we see a larger greenhouse effect. Now, the larger greenhouse effect causes an increase to global temperature and it is this extra greenhouse gas that is causing an unnatural global warming phenomena and this extra greenhouse gas is created by human activity now to use another analogy about space we've already seen that mars is a very cold planet because there is no greenhouse gas there at all venus on the other hand is an incredibly hot planet it is the hottest planet in our solar system. Why? Not because it's closest to the sun, that's Mercury. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system because it has an atmosphere filled with carbon dioxide, massive amounts of carbon dioxide. Yes, it's all there naturally, but there is a massive amount of carbon dioxide and it is trapping heat and it is causing global warming on a massive scale. So as we pump more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, 
we are essentially allowing more heat to be trapped in our atmosphere and we are causing the temperatures of our atmosphere to increase. This artificial greenhouse effect is changing the balance of our environment. It is changing the natural climate and that is not a beneficial thing. Now I just want to take a quick sidestep and I want to very very briefly talk about the difference in weather and climate. Most people understand this difference but the distinction isn't always clear and a lot of people who don't understand climate change say it's just weather and I just want to address that point before I really get on to look at the hard science behind what's causing global warming and how we know it's real. People often confuse weather and climate but they are not the same thing. Weather is what we describe as the local atmospheric conditions at any given time that we are experiencing. So if you look out the window and it is sunny, that is the weather. If you look out the window and it's raining, that is the weather. That is just the weather at that specific point in time in that location. Climate is essentially the average weather, either for the globe or for a region, and it is the conditions over a long period of time, over a year, over 10 years, over 20 years. So climate is the average weather conditions. And you would expect over a few years, yes, the weather is going to change on a daily basis, but the average weather conditions should not change much. With climate change, we are seeing long term changes to the climate. The daily weather might not change much, but the culminative effect is causing a big change to climate. So even as the Earth's climate changes and the temperatures get hotter, it's still possible to have very, very cold days. But climate change is talking about the change to the average conditions of our atmosphere, not the daily conditions. So let's have a look very, very briefly at the Earth's climate. And I'm going to look from about 500 million years ago. And the reason why we're not going to go back further than 500 million years is because the Earth was incredibly different more than 500 million years ago. About 500 million years ago, we're into a period called the Cambrian. And this is when life really started to exist. So the conditions are analogous to what we might see today. And the first thing that we need to notice about between about 500 million years ago, and about 100 million years ago, is that the Earth's climate did actually fluctuate a lot. The climate at some point was about 14 degrees Celsius warmer than it is today, and at other points it was as low as about 4 degrees below what we see today. So there were large changes to climate, and no climate scientist is going to deny this. But these changes take a large amount of time. These changes didn't just happen in a few thousand years. These changes took millions of years. Now, if we look along from about 60 million years to about 10 million years ago, we can see, again, we have similar fluctuations. The temperature did get as high as 14 degrees warmer than it is today. And in fact, during this period, it didn't drop to as low as we see today. So the climate of the Earth was warmer. And this is not a question. This is not in debate. And we're going to address this later on, but a lot of people say, well, hang on a minute, the Earth's climate used to be warmer, so perhaps global warming isn't real, perhaps it's all natural. But it's not quite as simple as that. Because if we look between about 5 million years ago and about 1,000 years ago, so geologically speaking, we're really, really talking about recent changes here. The temperatures were either not much warmer or a little bit colder than we see today. We then get to even more recent times and we can see that actually climate was perhaps a little bit colder. Still lots of fluctuations going on. However, those fluctuations took a long time still. They weren't quick. They don't happen over 100 years or 1,000 years. We're talking tens of thousands of years to see a one or two degree change in temperature. And then we get to really the present day. Geologically speaking, this is a blink of an eye. And we can see for about the last 10,000 years, the Earth's climate has not fluctuated much. It may have fluctuated by half a degree, a degree at most, but it's been very, very, very constant. And then we see what happened over the last 2,000 years. And for about 
1800 years or so, the climate of the Earth was clearly much cooler than it is today. And there were fluctuations and maybe every 50 years, let's say, there may have been a slight change of 0 0.1 degrees Celsius. It's a very small change and it's cyclical. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. There's no real pattern to it. There's no overall trend. If anything, the overall trend is that things were getting slightly cooler. And then we get to the period in the red when the Industrial Revolution occurred to the present day where carbon dioxide begins to be pumped out into the atmosphere. And suddenly, over these 2,000 years, we've gone from having a very constant climate with only very, very small changes to what we suddenly see today where temperatures on average have increased massively. And you can just look at the spike of that line. It does not follow any trend. That is literally showing you a one degree Celsius increase in average global temperature. And it's happened over a hundred years. When we've looked at other graphs of 500 million years ago, a change of one degree Celsius took millions of years. And yet in a hundred years, we're seeing that change. This is much, much faster and it coincides absolutely with the Industrial Revolution. It coincides absolutely with the massive increase in human population. And it coincides with humans pumping massive amounts of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Nowhere in geological history have we seen a change like this happening so quickly, but we see it now. And so those people denying climate change are actually cherry picking and saying, well, it's always happened. Well, it hasn't. They're not looking at the facts accurately. They're not really looking at the evidence. They're ignoring it. And it's there as plain as day to see. This has never happened before. We've never had such quick change to climate, but we see it now. Why? Because it's human activity. So all of these changes correspond absolutely with human activity and the release of greenhouse gases. It is not a coincidence. Now I want to have a quick look at the really recent climate of the Earth, because I think this is what's key. We've seen that climate has fluctuated before, and we need to now look at what's really happening since the Industrial Revolution. And we can see that when we actually look at what's happened over the last 140 years, well, we've had about a one degree, a bit more, a bit less of an increase to average temperatures around the world. Now, compared to the 14 degree changes we saw 500 million years ago, that seems pretty small. But what's really key here is that this change is unprecedented. Whereas the changes we've seen before maybe took 10 million years or 100,000 years, we're seeing a change of one degree in 140 years. And that is such a short period of time for such a massive change to occur. So it's not just faster by a little bit, it's faster by many, many, many times that at any point during human history, it is the fastest that the climate has ever changed without some kind of catastrophic event taking place. Now, if we take it one step further and we actually look at what's predicted we can see there are lots of different climate models here. And in fairness, they disagree with each other quite a lot. Some climate models say we'll have a two degree change by the year 2100. Some of these models say we'll have a five degree change. So that's, that's a big change, it's a big difference. And I know a lot of climate skeptics say, well, hang on a minute, you, you're not really predicting very accurately. There are these wide variations, you're just making these numbers up. But the reality is that all of these models predict an increase in climate. And although the range is from two degrees to five degrees, what we do find is every single one of these models is above the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. And remember, anything above 1.5 degrees Celsius is basically catastrophic. You look at this and you think, yes, the models vary. And they vary because they've looked at the data in slightly different ways but they all predict big changes. And what we're seeing now, so that some of these models are 10 years old, some of these models are 15 years old, 
what we're seeing is that they're actually pretty much correct about what they predicted over the last 15 years. And so if they continue to be correct and there's no reason to think they won't, we're going to see some absolutely catastrophic change to climate. And the only real way these predictions are not going to be correct anymore is if we change our ways as a species, if we no longer release this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We've gone on a lot about the fact that climate's increasing, and I've mentioned time and time again that it's carbon dioxide causing this, but quite rightly, a lot of you are probably saying, well, hang on a minute, I want some evidence for this. Well, the evidence is clear. We can see here there is a graph correlating carbon dioxide concentration and global temperature. I apologise that global temperature is in degrees Fahrenheit. That is an appalling unit. However, that is what the graph is in, and so we're going to take it at that. It doesn't really matter too much for our purposes. Now, the black line on this graph is carbon dioxide concentration, and we can see that it is continually going up. If we look at the blue and the red bar chart, that is showing us temperature anomaly, the difference from the average temperature. And we can see before about 1940, every year was less than average. Between about 1940 and about 1980, it varied a bit. Some were more than average, some were less than average. After 1980, we can see that every single year is warmer than average. Every single year. And we can see that the concentration of carbon dioxide is also increasing every single year. So quite clearly, there is a link between the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and there is a link between the global temperature. This link is undeniable. If we go back and we look at our graphs from before and we look at where the global climate was even warmer, well, actually, if we look at the carbon dioxide concentrations there, again, they were incredibly high. So there is a definite link between the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global temperatures. It is an undeniable link. And it can also be shown experimentally in laboratories that there is this link. Yet some people still deny it. Lots of people will say, well, hang on a minute. Human activity can't cause this much of a change of carbon dioxide. But the reality is carbon dioxide levels now in the year 2019 are over 400 parts per million. If we look at our chart in, in 1880, they would be low 300 parts per million. So we're seeing a 25% increase roughly in the amount of carbon dioxide in their atmosphere. And this is caused purely because of human activity releasing carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. So it's also worth pointing out that if you look at the charts for temperature, the vast majority of the hottest years on record have all come in the last decade. And we're going to continue having hottest year after hottest year after hottest year. And it's just going to carry on and carry on and carry on. We're not going to drop back down to a below average year. Not unless something drastic happens. And even then, we're probably going to be waiting hundreds of years for the carbon dioxide level of our atmosphere to drop enough anyway. So the climate is continuing to get warmer and warmer and warmer. Now, a lot of people are going to say, but hang on a minute, scientists have been wrong in the past. Climate scientists have got it wrong. So actually, we can't really trust the science. And it's true. In the past, scientists have made predictions about climate that have been wrong. And yes, science is not always right. But this is the beauty of science. Science is always corrected by doing more science, by doing more detailed science and better science. Science is never corrected by people saying, hang on a minute, you got it wrong once, so I don't believe you anymore. I'm just going to ignore it. And which is essentially what climate change deniers are doing. So yes, science has been wrong in the past, but we don't think it is anymore. Now, in the past, scientists have said, we reckon that we're going to go through a period of global cooling. So we've seen a bit of warming and now we're going to cool back down again. And these predictions were made in about the 50s, 60s, maybe even as late as the 70s. So, yes, there was a cooling prediction made in the past. And we can see it quite obviously 
that in the last 20, 30 years, that cooling prediction was very, very wrong. We have had global warming, which is, of course, why we have this crisis now. But the reason why these scientists got it wrong at the time was because their predictions were based on far less data. They just didn't have the information that we have today. And if you cast your mind back to the graphs that we looked at earlier, especially the graph of average temperature per year over recent history, when these predictions were made, some years were slightly warmer than normal, some years were slightly cooler than normal, but there was a fairly regular variation. It might have been that the average was slightly higher than normal, but overall, it was very hard to pick out that trend, especially over a short period such as 10 years, when climate change takes much longer. So there was far less data, and when you only have a few years worth of data, you tend to then look back over larger trends, which would have shown, perhaps, if things carry on as they always used to carry on, then we're going to get some global cooling. What scientists didn't realize at the time, again, because they lacked data, was the massive impact that carbon dioxide had on temperatures. We now have this data, we now have this information, we now have a much bigger picture, so we can understand why scientists got it wrong before, and we understand why we've got it right now. And we can see a much fuller picture of what's happening, and we can actually see that our predictions are now correct. So, the warming trends that were seen before when global cooling was predicted, was based on much less data. Also, because there was much less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the variation to temperature was much, much lower. It had a much smaller impact because there was less global warming when these predictions were made because we weren't pumping as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As time has progressed, as we've become closer to the present day, we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, so the temperature anomaly has been bigger, which makes it much easier to spot these patterns and make even more accurate predictions. Another really key thing which we have today that scientists just didn't have back when these predictions were made in the past is that we now have an abundance of satellite data. This really creates a full picture. And before, scientists just weren't playing with that information. They just didn't have that information. And if you don't have all the information, you cannot make a full prediction. So, the climate models that are proposed today are just better because we have the data. And we're seeing that the predictions that were made 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when we had more data, are coming true. 20 years ago, they were saying there's going to be global warming and it's going to be roughly what we're seeing today. And it's happening. So we know that we are correct now. We may have been wrong in the past, but we know because of the data and because we can see the predictions coming true that everything we say about global warming, that it's happening and how much it's happening by, is correct. Now, Another thing that you quite often hear from climate skeptics, those who don't believe in climate change, is to say, well, what about these things called Milankovitch cycles? And climate scientists know about Milankovitch cycles, and climate skeptics also know about Milankovitch cycles. The difference is scientists tend to understand it better. So, there are these naturally occurring cycles to our climate called Milankovitch cycles. And they've always happened, and they do always have an impact on our climate. Sometimes the Milankovitch cycles can cause global warming. Sometimes they can cause global cooling. And essentially, and this is a big simplification here because I don't think it's especially relevant, but Milankovitch cycles describe the movement of the Earth around the Sun and how it impacts on the climate. And there are three main parts of the cycle. There's the eccentricity of the orbit, basically how circular the orbit is, and the Earth's orbit does change from being more circular to less circular. And as it becomes less circular, the Earth will sometimes move closer to the Sun and sometimes move further away from the Sun. The tilt of Earth's axis changes, and as that changes, it changes the position of the equator in relation to the Sun. And finally, you have the Earth's position in relation to other planets and other stars, not quite as important. 
Now these cycles, as we've already said, cause either cooling or warming on Earth. Now, this is where the climate skeptics are going to unfortunately fall down flat on their faces with their statement that Milankovitch cycles are causing this effect because the current cycles that we're experiencing are actually leading to cooling conditions. And those cycles, based on what we understand historically, will lead to roughly 23,000 years worth of cooling. So this, this cooling cycle is going to go on for another 23,000 years. So actually, instead of the Earth getting warmer because of Milankovitch cycles at the moment, we should be getting cooler. Despite this, the Earth is warming. So, yes, Milankovitch cycles have an impact on the Earth's climate. Quite categorically at the moment, they are not causing global warming. These cycles are not causing the climate change that we see today. So, Milankovitch cycles, I'm afraid, to all those climate skeptics out there, are not responsible for the Earth warming at the moment. We need to understand then what is contributing to climate change. We know it's methane, we know it's carbon dioxide, they're the main culprits, but we need to understand a little bit more about it. Now, we already know that climate change is a natural process, it's a continual process, and it's important. Remember, without global warming or climate change in general, the Earth would be too cold to sustain life. So a, good, a little bit of the global warming is a good thing. But the accelerated rate of climate change that we see today is categorically, as we've already seen, due to human activity. And it's primarily due to the release of carbon dioxide and methane gases into our atmosphere. They are both greenhouse gases. They both work in slightly different ways. And for the purpose of this video, I don't think that's particularly important to get into. So both gases are produced during the extraction of fossil fuels when we get coal, natural gas, oil out of the ground. We're going to be producing carbon dioxide and we're going to be producing a lot of methane. In fact, natural gas is mainly methane. When we burn these fuels through aviation, through driving our cars, through producing things in factories, from turning up the heating in our house. Every time we do that, we are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Methane gas is also produced in incredibly large quantities by agriculture. And there are two main sources of methane in agriculture, livestock farming and paddy fields where we grow rice. And again, I'm not going to get into the reasons why, because I don't think that's particularly important. So we've gone through and we've looked at what global warming is. We've looked at how we know global warming is happening. We've looked at some of the things that are creating these greenhouse gases, but yet none of this says emergency yet. So we really need to look at why we're calling this a climate emergency. And well, the reasons, I'm afraid, are going to become quite clear when we look at these consequences. So, As we've already said, any climate change above one and a half degrees Celsius is going to be catastrophic. There's barely any part of the Earth's environment or the ecosystems that would not be affected in a negative way by a change above one and a half degrees Celsius. And these impacts would, for the vast majority, be negative. There may be one or two very minuscule positive effects, but they're going to be massively outweighed by these negative impacts that are really going to be caused by global warming and a change above one and a half degrees Celsius. So the first thing that's going to happen, and we, we can see this happening now, all the time in the news, is extreme weather. Extreme weather is going to become far more frequent. And although it's only anecdotal, within your lifetimes, you've probably noticed this. Now, it's worth pointing out, anecdotes are not data. It's not scientific. But, of course, scientists do measure these things. And we can see quite categorically that extreme weather is becoming more frequent. And not only is extreme weather becoming more frequent, but the extreme weather is becoming more violent. For example, we are seeing more hurricanes. Those hurricanes as well as being more frequent, are becoming stronger. They're becoming more devastating. Well, that is linked directly to climate change. On average, summers are becoming hotter for the vast majority of the Earth. As these summers become hotter, we have more heat waves, we have more droughts. Drought is obviously an incredibly bad thing. 
in Europe recently, especially in France and Spain, we've seen massive heat waves and there has been large loss of life, especially with the elderly, because of this increased heat, because of this heat that's so far above what we normally experience. So we're going to have longer, hotter, drier summers in much of the world. In other parts of the world, their summers might not become drier, they might be hotter, but they might actually become wetter. And in other parts of the world, instead of seeing drought, we're going to see more flooding. So we're going to two extremes. We might see more drought, we might see more flooding. What we're not going to see as much of is the normal weather pattern, the more moderate weather. That's going to be disappearing, that's going to be far less frequent, and it's going to be replaced by more extreme weather. But it's not just hotter summers that we're going to see. Quite conversely and quite counterintuitively, parts of the world will get hotter summers, but they're also going to get colder winters. And they're going to see more extreme winters. They're going to see more extreme blizzards. They're going to see more extreme snowfall. So, yes, global warming will cause average global temperatures to increase, but that still means in winter you might see more extreme winter weather. We're going to see melting of the ice caps. Now, again, this is something that is already observed and it is already completely measured by science and we can see it happening and it is, it is quite shocking just how much this is happening. So if you look at these two pictures here, the picture at the bottom shows the polar ice caps at the North Pole on September the 14th, 1984. And you can see it extends quite far. It practically extends to Russia. It extends all the way to Canada. If you look at the picture at the top, the ice in 2012, it's, it's just so much less. There is so much less ice because the temperatures are getting warmer. So less ice forms at the North Pole. And so you get less ice there in the summer. Now, what we expect to happen quite tragically is by about the year 2050, there's expected to be no ice at all at the North Pole over the summer months. Now that is because of climate change. This destroys the habitats of animals that live at the poles, such as polar bears. They don't have any ice to stay It's much, much harder for them to hunt. You're going to see them becoming smaller. You're going to see their populations dwindling and perhaps even see an extinction. But it also, this ice disappearing does something else quite interesting. It creates what we call a positive feedback loop. Now, the ice caps have got high albedo. What this means is they are reflective. Do you remember all the way back at the start of this video, we're explaining how global warming works. And we said the clouds reflect a lot of heat back into space. Well, ice being white actually reflects a lot of heat back into space. So that heat is not absorbed by the Earth. Well, if we look at these two pictures here, 1973, this glacier, lots and lots and lots of ice. 2006, not so much ice. In 1973, as heat hits the Earth on the glacier, it reflects that heat back into space. In 2006, that heat is going to be absorbed by the Earth. That causes heating. And when you get an increased amount of heating, you get more ice melting. As you get more ice melting, you get less heat reflected back into space, which causes more heating, which causes more ice melting, which causes even less heat being thrown back into space. So you get a positive feedback loop where the changes build up on each other and the temperature goes up and up and up and up continually. What you also find is that ice caps, as they melt, quite obviously, water flows into the oceans. And as more water flows into the oceans, global sea levels rise. And we can see in this picture here, this is what's predicted in about the year 2100 for global sea levels if things continue as they are. We can see the globe is going to look quite different. Lots and lots of land masses are going to be covered with water. Now raised sea levels are going to flood coastal cities. Remember we said a very large proportion of the world's population lives relatively close to the coast within about 20 miles. These areas are going to get flooded where people live. It is going to get flooded. So by the year 2100, average sea levels are expected to rise by about half a metre. That might not sound like a lot. Believe me, that is a huge amount.
if we have this half a meter of sea level rise, if these predictions, as we can see on this picture here, come true, what we find is you're going to have mass migrations of people. People are going to have to migrate away from where they once lived because their homes are going to be underwater. As you get these massive amounts of people migrating, you end up with a refugee crisis. People are going to be forced to live closer together. People are not going to have anywhere to live. And so global warming is going to cause a completely different crisis, a humanitarian crisis. Now, we're already seeing this in parts of Southeast Asia and parts of the Pacific Ocean. Some of the small Pacific islands are becoming flooded. The sea level is rising, people are losing their homes. This is only going to get more severe as sea level continues to rise, if global warming continues and the ice caps melt. We've already said we're going to see more extreme weather, and this extreme weather is going to cause crops to fail. You're going to have more flooding, more drought. This means farmers growing crops aren't going to be able to grow as much because the conditions are not going to be very good. If conditions for growing crops isn't very good, crops die, we have less food to eat, we have famine, we have starvation. This is unavoidable and it's happening already. There are a few things we can do to mitigate this, such as genetically modified organisms. But the simple truth is, global warming is going to prevent us from growing enough food to feed the population. You also have to consider that in 50 years time, the world's population is going to be even larger. We're going to have even more mouths to feed. And we're going to find it very, very difficult to do, if not impossible, if global warming continues. Now, I did say earlier that there are some benefits of global warming, and this is possibly one. And that's that some parts of the world might see increased growing seasons. So the last frost of winter is going to come a little bit earlier. So farmers can grow their crops earlier. The first frost of winter is going to come a little bit later, so farmers can continue to grow their crops longer. They have a longer growing season. This is fantastic for a very, very, very small part of the world. Most of the world is still going to be suffering from this extreme weather, and it is going to have a very, very negative net impact on the amount of food that we can grow. So, although a small area will see benefit in terms of the amount of food they can grow, the overall impact is going to be very negative. Global warming is also going to cause habitat destruction and perhaps mass extinction. Now, mass extinction is when lots and lots of species become extinct at the same time. And it generally only happens when there's a catastrophic event. Now, you're probably aware, about 65 million years ago, a massive, massive, massive meteorite crashed into Earth in Mexico. And what happened? The dinosaurs became extinct. But in fact, it wasn't just the dinosaurs. It was all sorts of life became extinct 65 million years ago, and it took millions of years for life to recover. So only when you have a catastrophe do you see mass extinction. Right now, humanity and what we are doing to our climate is that catastrophe. So climate change is going to lead to habitats being destroyed. Oceans become more acidified. Coral reef gets destroyed. Rainforests become dry. You see more forest fires. The poles and the tundra become warmer, ice pack melts, desert spread because of the increased drought. So these changes are going to occur far faster than the majority of plants or animal species can possibly adapt to them. Humans will probably be able to adapt to an extent, but most species on Earth will not. So it could lead to extinction and perhaps mass extinction, all because of what we are doing to our climate. So what can we actually do to make a difference? This all sounds incredibly negative. It all sounds very worrying, and it is. I mean, it, to call it a climate emergency is, is not an understatement. It is, it is what's happening, and it's, it's very, very scary. But we can still do things. It's not too late to make a difference. If humanity acts now, we can still keep climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we can keep climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius, then we can still have relative normality on the planet. So if everyone starts to make small changes to their lifestyles, we can reduce the carbon output, we can reduce the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and we can really start to make that difference. 
So just simple things, eating less meat, especially red meat. Now, some people will say stop eating meat altogether. That, that's going to be a personal choice. But if you eat less meat and especially less red meat, you're going to be having a far smaller impact on the environment. If you buy food that has fewer food miles, that means it's being transported less. It's going to release less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. When we're not using our electronic devices, turn them off. Saving energy, you're saving yourself money for one, but you're also reducing the amount of carbon dioxide being released. Now, when I say turn electronic devices off, turn them off, not just the standby, off. It makes a difference, a very small difference, but if everybody does it, it adds up phenomenally. Use energy saving light bulbs. In the past, people didn't like them because the light looked unnatural. The latest energy saving light bulbs, as well as using even less energy, produce a far more natural colored light. They're a bit more expensive to buy, but they produce far less carbon dioxide because they need far less power and they save you money. Travel less, use your car less, use public transport more, walk more, ride a bike more. Simple changes like this can have a huge impact. Obviously there are times when people still need to drive, but in that case, if you need to, try to car share. Do what you can to use cars less. And again, guess what? It saves you money. Fly less. I know everyone likes taking a holiday. Who doesn't? But try to fly less. Try to reduce that travel. That's not saying take no holidays. Take one holiday a year. Try to travel less for business. If you can, use video conferencing, use telecommunication. You don't always need to meet face to face. Aeroplanes and aviation are a huge source of carbon dioxide. Properly insulate your home. This means you don't need the heating up as high in winter. It means you don't need the air conditioning on as high in the summer. This means you're releasing less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Avoid what we call fast fashion. Fast fashion is what people do these days. You go to the shop, you buy something, you wear it once, you toss it away. The amount of carbon dioxide wasted by that is huge. Buy something that's quality. Wear it for a long time. Go to a charity shop, buy something secondhand. These things will have a huge impact on your carbon footprint and how much carbon dioxide you're releasing into the atmosphere. And finally, install solar panels or wind turbines in your house if you can. These will create electricity for you, but you won't be using fossil fuels. You won't be releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, eat on their own. All of these changes are pretty small. But if you were to do all of these things, you are going to have a big impact on your own carbon footprint. If everybody does this, it's going to be a huge reduction. If we can reduce our carbon footprint now, we might have a chance of meeting that one and a half degree Celsius limit. But although those things are all important, perhaps the most important thing is to lobby your local MP, your representative, whatever political system your country uses, lobby them, tell them you do not want fossil fuels. You do not want these polluting energy sources. Tell them to invest in green technology, green policy all the time. You need to let your MPs know that you do not want pollution. Try and buy from companies that are taking an active interest in the environment and doing what they can to reduce their carbon footprints. These things are going to make a big difference. We might be able to do it. We might be able to keep it to one and a half degrees Celsius, but we have to start now. It is an emergency. So what can we conclude from this? Well, we now know that climate change is real. There, there's no debate in this. There's no denying it. And if you do debate, it, if you do deny it, I'm afraid you just do not understand the science behind it. Climate change is real and it's caused by humans. We need to, we must, we have to limit the rise in global temperature to an absolute maximum of one and a half degrees Celsius because above that, it's game over.
It really is. So we are at the crossroads now. The, today is already too late, but better late than never. We have to take drastic, drastic, drastic action. That action might impact you a little bit on your day-to-day -day life. It might slightly reduce your quality of life. But your children will thank you. Your grandchildren will thank you. Future generations will thank you. If we delay any further, it is too late to make that difference. Changes of two degrees or more are just catastrophic. It just doesn't even bear thinking about. We've seen the impact of it. We, we know what's going to happen. We can predict it. We can model it. So it's not about science getting it wrong anymore because we know we know what's going to happen and it's not good for the planet and it's not good for humanity. So any change greater than two degrees, massive damage in terms of the ecology of the planet and in terms of extinctions, but also to humanity, how we live our lives. Or if we can even carry on living our lives, we could become part of that mass extinction. So the impact on humanity, the threat to humanity, this is it. This is our biggest threat. Our biggest threat is not how much money we have in the bank. Our biggest threat is not, are we going to war with somebody? Oh, this is our threat, what our climate is doing. There is no bigger threat to humanity. There is no bigger problem on this planet right now than what we are doing to our climate. And we have to fix it. So we know there are going to be increases to extreme weather, to flooding, to droughts. We know that sea levels are going to rise and we're going to have flooding in the coastal areas. We know we're going to have migration because of this. We know that we're not going to be able to grow crops as well as we can. So we're going to see starvation and famine. But it is not too late. It really isn't. We can make the changes. We can reduce our carbon footprint. We can save this planet. But we can't do it unless everybody starts making those changes now so i really really hope that you've taken on board why this is a climate emergency i hope you now know about the science behind climate change and why it's real i hope that you know what needs to be done and that you're willing to take those steps to do it and that you need to tell everybody about it because if you don't, it's going to be too late. Now, it makes science easy. This isn't what we normally do. We're not a political group. We're not advocating anything. We don't have an agenda other than science. And we're here to teach people science, to help people understand the world around them, to make everybody science literate. And this is the biggest science issue of the day. So if you want to know more about science, if you're interested in learning more about science, Come and visit us at www.makescienceeasy.com. The link is going to be in the description below. But please, let's make those changes tomorrow. Or even better, let's start making those changes today. Let's change our lifestyles for good. Until next time, keep on learning.